And it is John Epperson uh, who uh, gave this young man, Phil McCoy, his big break in life. Phil took advantage of it. Now Phil manages billions and billions of dollars. And, and only has one client. That's John. <laughs> <laughs> that's just gives Jeff a bill. I was going to do the same thing. You just beat me to it. Yeah. There, are, there, is, there is no uh, no honor among thieves, I tell you. No, not one, sir. Phil, good morning to you. Good morning, guys. How are you all? <laughs> We are we are better than where we began. That's there we all, go. all I can tell you there. So uh, Gilstrap, who doesn't generally venture into the world of football, okay, came in today and began telling a story about an unhappy football player, uh, Patrick Mahomes, right? Yeah. The Kansas City Chiefs controversy. All right, let me let me tell yeah. the whole story. Go ahead. What I said was there's a controversy with Kansas City, so that means I get 15 minutes to do research while you all talk about sports ball. That's that's what yeah, that's first what off, I said. If you want to sound like you know a little bit about sports, don't call it sports ball because no, nobody I, I'd understand nobody that. says that. That's 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 the point. <laughs> I don't understand. I you know I don't call it the, sports the, ball. That's okay. the first thing you want right, to fit in, right? right? Uh, I saw this play live yesterday. This was, first and foremost, this was for the end of the Kansas City-Buffalo game at the end of the fourth quarter. And uh, Travis Kelsey, the Chiefs tight end, catches a pass from Patrick Mahomes. And then, uh, before he gets tackled, laterals the ball, throws, a, throws the ball laterally to the left and behind. It's caught and running for a touchdown. It's an amazing play. I don't think it was planned. I don't think it was planned. I think it was improvised, but but regardless, it was pretty amazing to pull that off. It gets negated because the knucklehead receiver lines up in the neutral zone, okay? And he was way into the neutral zone, so his he's he, it, so. it's not like he, yes, was, he was an was. inch into it. He was he's he was stepping beyond the football, so they call the play back and 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 Patrick Mahomes, uh, once on the next couple of plays, he throws incomplete passes comes over and just starts berating the linesman who made the call. And then his teammates are holding him back, and then he's still berating him after the game is over. I hope Patrick Mahomes gets suspended <laughs> and fined an exorbitant amount of money. Because, the, you know, in the NFL, it's hard to blow a call because there's replay everywhere for everything, right? But this was clear when they showed how the guy lined up, that he lined up offside. If you're a wide receiver... There is no reason whatsoever to line up offside because you look down the line at the football in an unimpeded view because all the linemen are back a half a yard off the ball. If they're the tackles, they're back almost a full yard or more sometimes. So there's no excuse to line up offside. Who he should have been mad at was the 19, number 19, the knucklehead, yeah. Tony, who lined up in the freaking neutral zone and blew the play up. That's who he should have been mad at, not the referee who was doing his job. Patrick Mahomes gets the benefit of roughing the passer calls that most quarterbacks don't get because of who he is. He benefits from a slant in the officiating, and now he's upset at the officials because they called this one by the rule book? He's had to be held back by his teammates from assaulting the referee, getting in his face. He should be suspended for at least a game, maybe two. Find $150,000, $200,000. It wouldn't put a dent in his income. But it'd be a significant wow. fine. You know, I've been missing a good Rob rant, and now we I mean, get it this morning. That's what you just said you're doing better than you were before. Now you got you on Patrick Mahomes, and you're all fired up. I was appalled at a guy who benefits from slanted and biased officiating because of the roughing. The you put a finger on on Mahomes, and you get a call. Dylan Bishop's got his headphones on. He want to. He looks like he's eager to talk. You're good, Dylan. Yeah, and he goes in the post-game press conference, and he says it not only costs us the game, but this is a great play in the Hall of Fame career of Travis Kelsey that won't get the count now, and it affects Travis Kelsey's Hall of Fame case. What a baby. <laughs> I didn't even, I didn't hear the post-game at all, so I'm glad you brought that up because that makes it even worse. And that's all he was talking about to Josh Allen when they went and did their post-game handshake, too. He just goes, oh, it's all, what, an, what an awful call. And I don't even think Josh Allen knew what he was talking about. But he just... Well, how, couldn't stop whining. Well, how about this? How about you look at your wide receiver in the neutral zone before the ball snapped and say, move back, knucklehead, you're offside. What is this? Well, is, his worse. first day playing Nine football? Could, James Tony can look over at the referee to check. Yeah. Well, he can look over like, hey, am I, am, I, am I good? And he's got the ability to do that, and then the referee can tell him to scooch back. So there's really no excuse. You're right. He should, he should be bad at his receiver more so. But more so than the referee. And it was a great play, but the referee didn't know that when he threw the flag. I'm one that normally, like, if it doesn't impact the game, 
then I would prefer it not be called. But in that case, man, that goes all the way back to midget league. Now, I'm one that I would get called uh, for not being up on the line. So I've gotten called before. And even as a tackle, I can look over, and the referee would tell me, scoot up. You don't even really have to ask. You can just look over. Just look at him like, hey, am I good? <laughs> and yeah. they'll tell you. So that, that's that what they do. I'm not as mad at Patrick Mahomes as you are, <laughs> but he was wrong. He was so wrong. And what, what, if, what offends me even worse, like I said, is because he benefits from officials who protect him. And now he's upset because somebody called a play by the rule book? He's in, he plays a position where the NFL has made it almost impossible for defensive linemen to do their jobs. You're 300 pounds and you tackle a guy, and gravity pulls you down on top of the guy. That's now a penalty in the NFL. Turkey Joe Jones grabbed Terry Bradshaw, turned him upside down, and spiked him on his head. And it wasn't a penalty in the 1970s. And now if you fall on a quarterback, it's a penalty. He should shut up. Turkey Joe Jones. This rant has taken you to Turkey this, Joe Jones. Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> my rant, I'm going all the way back to Turkey to Joe Jones. <laughs> You've got to get my horse thing out of the way. You've got to do the Turkey Joe Jones. <laughs> Turkey Joe Jones. I, I friend, a, a guy I coach Turkey. with is from Who Cleveland. Is Turkey Joe Jones? He says Turkey Joe Jones doesn't have to pay for a drink or a meal anywhere in Cleveland because he spiked Terry Bradshaw on top of his head. <laughs> Turkey Joe. Turkey Joe Jones. That's right. And he didn't get suspended. He didn't even get a rough in the passer penalty. This is how the game has changed to protect these babies who play quarterback now. And he's going to complain because the referee <laughs> called a guy offside who was dumb enough to line up in the neutral zone. It's your job as a wide receiver to look where the ball is. And then you check with the ref. And you put your foot, you put your hand forward like thumbs up, I'm on. Or you put it back like I'm supposed to be off. And the ref tells you how to line up. Yeah, he'll he'll tell you. Yeah, he'll tell you. John, I'm not about to jump in this discussion. I don't know what to say. <laughs> he, when he dropped the turkey, Joe Jones, I'm done. <laughs> you you just want the horse thing taken out of rotation. Blame your I teammate. Want it, I want it out of the rotation. <laughs> turkey Joe Jones. I deserve to have the horse thing taken out of the rotation. Now. <laughs> blame your teammate. Don't the blame the ref. Turkey Joe Jones. This is this is where we are as a society. Blame the judge. You know the judge is biased. Is. The judge <laughs> sentenced me. The judge fined me. It's a crooked courtroom. They're all against me, right? This is what this I is what Mahomes this, is doing. He's blaming the judge. I, I think this is leftover aggression from our Pittsburgh Steelers, absolutely stinking it up the last two weeks. I think that's what this is. If Pittsburgh would have won the last two games, you wouldn't be talking about Turkey Joe Jones. And Patrick Mahomes. No, I disagree. I uh, the Steelers have made me numb, not angry. I'm, I'm numb. You lose back. To, you lose back to back home games to two and ten teams. You, there's no anger in that. That's just numb. And, and poor Patrick Mahomes and Turkey Joe Jones is taking the blunt, the blunt for it. So, yeah, it's a good rant. That's a good I rant. don't disagree. It wasn't a bad rant, right? That was a good I'm rant. Not that, I'm not that. I'm you, not that mad. I'm not as angry as you, but I do agree. The only thing you, better would have been if Hillary Clinton was the side judge. That would have been the only thing that would have made this better. <laughs> I just watched the Turkey Joe Jones. You just look it up. Yeah, I did. Yeah, I look. Did. He grabbed, Bradshaw does not get up right no. away. <laughs> he spikes. He spikes him. He, yeah. he turned. He suplexed him and yeah. put him on the top of his head. And that wasn't even a penalty Ooh. in the 1970s. Back when football players were tough. <laughs> wow. Phil, let's talk about the yes, markets, sir. baby. We, we've been having let's a pretty good – ever ever since, uh, what, September, we've been having a pretty good uh, little rally here. We've been on it, yeah. A, a, a November was really, really good. October, however, was bad. But it, and it is all – it's the same old story. And, and I, I wish I had something else to talk about, uh, but it is. And it will probably go through the majority of 2024 – but as inflation continues to creep down and we see some of these measures that, that the Federal Reserve looks at continue to improve in regards to inflation, and that's why our markets are rallying. And they are baking in, starting to bake in a decrease in rates. And Wednesday is going to be a really interesting day. It's not so much what they do, again, because I think it's pretty safe to say that it's not going to do anything as far as the movement in rates. But do – does Jerome Powell open the door for rate cuts? Remember, the last meeting he was asked if there had been any discussion about when uh, cuts could come into play, and he had said, we haven't even discussed that yet. 
And so I'm wondering if this meeting comes around, if he doesn't bring that up, if he hasn't said, yeah, well, as, as we look at this, we will have to start to cut rates in 2024. We just don't know when yet or, or what his verbiage will be. And some of that may be, and I, it may be too soon, uh, the, the data may be too soon for him to react off of it, but the CPI comes out the day before. And, you know, as Bill had mentioned before, the alphabet soup, which is a good way, the CPI and the PPI and the PC and all these <laughs> all these readings, that starts just before the Federal Reserve speaks, which is tomorrow. So we have a heavy week of information that should help us determine where we're at in this battle against inflation. And it has been improving, and everything that we've seen is improving. Now, what we see, and this is the confusing part, is very, very confusing but what we've seen is softening economic data and softening jobs reports, and that is why our markets have done well. So it is kind of bad news in a vacuum. It's bad news, but when you look at the entire picture, and we're battling inflation, we are still battling inflation to get down to that target that John and I both agree. I wish they would just move the target a little bit. That would be helpful. But as, a, as we're battling inflation, bad news is good news, and it just hasn't been – so bad that it's put the fear of recession back into us. Now, that that will come. Trust me, that will come eventually where we start to talk about recession and are we going to go into a recession. And that's probably will coincide with the Federal Reserve cutting rates opposed to keeping them steady or increasing rates like they've been doing the last two years. You want to get me on a judge on a, on a yeah. Powell rant here, Bill. Because uh, yeah. no, I'll, I'll go there next. You Bill. are stirred up. You yeah. are stirred I'm, up. I'm, I'm warmed up. I'll, I'll go off on Chairman Powell. I'll, I will. <laughs> well, let's do, let's hear it, Rob. W- one good rent rent. Powell's war another. on the American economy <laughs> continues. Phil, he raises rates one more time. That's going to be the end. Yeah. And along with that, if they if if he does, we should send Turkey Joe Jones. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. Uh, Phil, over the weekend, or I read somewhere that there's a obviously a lot of the prognosticators say they will be reducing the interest rates, but there's a few that says the Feds will probably increase the interest rates. Uh, what I assume you're locked in uh, that they'll be decreasing as opposed to increasing. But what would be the rationale? for the even speculation of continual increase. Because of Powell's war on America and the economy. <laughs> Bill, I've already told you how many you times go. over the last two years. <laughs> See, I, I think that, that they're, they're prognosticating that some of this data that we look at will start to reverse course. And we have seen that in this battle with inflation where we say, hey, look, look how well everything's going and everything's starting to – inflation's starting to drop and the job market is softening – and, and, and that's where there's a handful that still thinks that there's another leg to go. And I, I don't know if they're right or wrong, but if we, if we, and that's why the CPI and the, in the retail reports and the, is it a Santa Claus rally or is it Grinch or, or what, what are we going to see through the holidays? There are some that thinks that the, the consumer is still complaining and not doing anything about it. And what I mean by that, and we've talked about this before, especially in, in regards to gas prices, where we can complain about how much things cost, but we don't do anything about it. So where's that breaking point? There's been signals that the consumer has reached the breaking point to some extent where we're, we're not spending as much or we're slowing down on, on, on gift buying or travel or whatever it may be. But there is that possibility that the strong consumer has been the issue all along where the consumer is willing to spend regardless of what prices are. So there's still a handful out there that think that the consumer's not broken yet. And if that's the case, if we start to see the CPI and that alphabet soup of of reports that we get start to turn and go the other way, where the Federal Reserve could say, look, look, we need to either keep rates higher longer, which was the narrative two meetings ago, uh, rates higher for longer, or we even need to increase rates one more time to get this all the way down. That's back to what John and I said uh, that we both agree with that get it all the way down to that two percent target, opposed to increasing the target to say two and a half to to make that a little bit more attainable. Because that that target is what you make it. You know that's not set in stone. You can make that target whatever you wish. Back in 2018, we wanted to get inflation up to 2.5 percent and not down to two percent. So that's why I always thought that hey, look, we're just over. We're just overshooting in hopes to get to 2.5% or something a little bit higher. But he doubled down on that, said it has to be to 2%. 
but nonetheless, if some of these some of these economic reports and retail reports and consumer spending and consumer confidence, if they turn and go the other way, especially drastically, yeah, it's possible that they increase rates again. Now, my and and, and Ameriprise and and myself personally think that we've reached the end of rate increases, and now it's more of a discussion of when they start to decrease rates opposed to whether or not they increase rates again. But there is there it could happen. And there is a debate to be had whether or not it will happen. <clears throat> Good morning. Um, I, I, I want to shift gears a little bit here. I was we we to, forgot you were even here. I know. <laughs> I know. I just sit quietly during these these sessions. Um, but I think Patrick Mahomes was perfectly justified. In <laughs> well, that's where you're wrong. <laughs> that's it. He did his research on the sports ball. So. He's, he is, you're right, Phil. He's got, he has an opinion. He's got the sports ball figured out now. So I want to shift over to Bitcoin. I saw today that Bitcoin topped $42,000, and it, it occurs to me that maybe I need to try to understand what Bitcoin actually is and why anybody would want to own it. Are you prepared to kind of give a, a, a pricey on, on the, the underpinnings of, of Bitcoin, and is it something someone should have in their portfolio? Uh, I'm, no, I'm not really prepared for that because we can't provide guidance on Bitcoin simply because Bitcoin in itself can't be held in our fiduciary accounts. So, And there's a reason for that. There's really, as, as you talk about, and, and, and cryptocurrency, has been has been more of a hot topic than what it is right now in the understanding of it. But when you really look at it and say, hey, what's the value of it? The value of it lies uh, only within the demand for it. So there's nothing like you can look at a company and say, hey, this is what this company is worth, and this is where this company is going based off of this reporter, that reporter, what's going on in the, econ- in the economy, or with a legislative action, and this will help or hurt a particular sector you can't really do that with bitcoin now the one thing that has long scared me about people that put too much money in bitcoin and you know where our case would be like look if you have fun with it have fun with it and put a little bit of money into it and hopefully i hope it i hope it gives you a million percent return and makes everybody rich but don't put so much into it certainly don't rely on that for your retirement accounts but the thing that scares me most if you can remember back to when bitcoin was around 65,000, 68,000 or something of that nature. And then the government of China put a lot of restrictions on Bitcoin and it dropped in value drastically. And that, that can happen quickly. That can happen quickly when a government becomes afraid of something. If they can't control, let's go back to the Federal Reserve and the executive branch. If they can't control our economy by moving interest rates or uh, spurring us along by encouraging us to spend or slow us down by discouraging us to spend. If Bitcoin gets in the way of that or if cryptocurrency gets in the way, and this is just my personal belief, if crypto gets in the way of that, the government will regulate it heavily and to discourage us from purchasing Bitcoin or relying on Bitcoin opposed to actual money. So we don't really, uh, we, we don't recommend or uh, or tell people not to purchase it, but we can't hold it in our accounts here at Ameriprise because we are fiduciaries, and that's really important. We are fiduciaries, and we have to be able to say this is why or why not something is being held in our accounts. This is the thing I, I find I can't wrap my head around when it comes to any of the cryptocurrencies. The fundamental, it has no value except as stated in greenbacks, right? So yes. it, it doesn't... Yes. So that it's not an alternative currency because it has no value other than how it is valued by. It can be converted to, to dollars. Yeah. So I just I feel like is this a little like the old tulip bubble story story from back in Holland and what is it, 300 years ago? I mean, people are just investing in it, driving up the price of something that has no inherent value until people it, realize that it has exactly. no inherent value. Yeah. Let, let me, uh, before you answer John's question, I want to kind of add to that. Right now we're having crypto surging. We're having stock surging. We have bond surging. We have gold surging. So all the medians that you kind of invest in are all surging. What does that tell you? Uh, it tells us that the consumer is moving away from cash and into investment. So if you really, and that's, that was part, that's part of the problem when interest rates go up, it makes cash opposed to, the stock market a little bit more attractive to say, hey, I can get a 5% guarantee here. Now, this perception, if you start to look at 
long dated cash products that that kind of the uh, CDs or the risk free rate of return those longer dated ones are starting to come down and we're anticipating that in recent months because of what we were just talking about the Federal Reserve starts to decrease rates um, then then all those the the risk free rate of return is going to be much lower and encourage people back into investments whether it's stocks or bonds even or or cryptocurrency for those that are interested in cryptocurrency so there is a surge coming or that has been happening back into the stock market back into the bond market and to crypto to some extent for those that are comfortable with it us ourselves we're not very comfortable with crypto for those stated reasons we can't we can't determine what the intrinsic value of it is and you know we get a question a lot with people afraid that crypto is going to replace the dollar and I don't really understand the fear because you have to use the dollar to buy crypto. So that's kind of where I end with, you know, we, we respond in that circumstance where it has no value other than what it can be converted back to to the dollar bill. And our fear, my fear, I uh, shouldn't say our, but my fear with the cryptocurrency is it's not it, – it could be heavily regulated by any government – that would slow down the attractiveness but, of it. But, Phil, my, my uh, question is, generally we think, traditionally we think of these moving in opposition. Stocks will move up when go, and gold will move up when stocks mm-hmm. move down. Uh, bonds mm-hmm. will move up when uh, stocks down. So they, they work in opposition. But now all of them seem to be working in parallel. The way well, it is, because it's, it's what caused it. Let's go back to rates. You know, I've only got about two minutes left. But bonds and stocks, typically move in opposition unless it's an interest rate environment where we're looking at the movement of interest rates. So go back to 2022 where your bond side of your portfolio fell drastically as well. That's what hurt more than the stocks. We expect that with their stocks, but we don't expect it with their bonds. And it is a mathematical equation that says, hey, this is what these bonds are worth. If I have a bond that's paying me 2% in current interest rates or 5% where my 2% bond isn't very attractive, on the secondary market. So therefore, it must be sold. The, the secondary market price of it is much less than what I paid for it. That's why you saw bond values go down. So the reason that our markets dropped stocks and bonds fell in 2022 was because of increasing interest rates. But the good news is, is when uh, interest rates begin to fall, it will, it will increase the prices of stocks and bonds at the same time. So the pain that we had through 2022 in pieces of 2023 should bring joy to us at some point when rates begin to fall. And there's no better way to look at that than go back to April of 2020 and look at the overall aggregate bond market and the stock market where they both did really, really well at the same time. Now, that's an exaggerated example because of how quickly they cut rates. And and to some extent, it was a surprise, so there was no lead up to it. But look at the stock market and the bond market in April of 2022 and then compare that to, or I'm sorry, April of 2020 and then compare it to 2022. And we could be in an environment where both of those go up at the same time again when rates begin to fall or when the discussion of rates falling really comes into play if Jerome Powell brings that up in his meetings. All right, Phil, how do we reach you for more information on investing and Turkey Joe Jones career highlights? I'm going to have to find out some more about Turkey Joe Jones, but you can reach us at 304-263-4343 or stop by and see us with an appointment at 1270 Winchester Avenue right here in Martinsburg. Thank you, Phil. And you can hear Phil's uh, two-minute outlook on the day's uh, economy as uh, he reports each weekday morning at 630 